morning and welcome to the Museum of the San Ramon Valley's virtual speaker series. I am Dan Dunn, the director of the museum. We are almost two years into the programs in this series. Past presentations have included California's first people and in now the Sonol Water Temple and last month, the history and the construction of the Caldecott Tunnel. We hope you've enjoyed the programs in this series. Did you know that mo major motion pictures were produced in the East Bay? From 1912 to 1916, SNA Studios had a production facility in Niles to take advantage of the area's beauty and good weather. Rena Keene and David Keene are from the Niles SNA Silent Film Museum and will tell us about the movies, the stars, and the museum that celebrates them. Please use the chat window at the bottom of the screen for any questions that you have. Feel free to send in questions at any time during the presentation and we'll address them at the end. And now it's my great pleasure to introduce to you, Rena and David Keene. Hello everybody. Good to be here. So we're gonna get started with a slideshow. We have a lot to share with you and we'll be happy to answer questions very soon. So let's do this sharing screen. Oh, sorry, our, our internet's just lovely. Okay, go ahead, David. Um, so uh, the uh, Central Pacific and the Niles in uh, 1869, and it was known as Vallejo Mills at that time. And you can see a few of the buildings to the uh, left of the uh, uh, train tracks that cross Alameda Creek. You circle your area. Oh, right over here. There. There yeah, we are. right in here. Uh, you can't see the the mill. Vallejo Mill is behind the creek. Uh, is behind the trees that uh, you, so you can't see it. There were two mills, one in the 1840s, one in 1852 that uh, um, ground flour for all of the uh, weed fields that were in the distance uh, past Alameda Creek that's in what was what's now today the city of Fremont itself. Um, this is uh, Niles in 1893 when uh, the town was finally rising up after uh, lots were being sold by the Southern Pacific Railroad Company um, south of the railroad tracks. And uh, some of these buildings are still here in Niles today. Uh, you can see uh, in the background uh, a farmhouse with uh, orchard, tree orchards all around. Uh, in the background, that farmhouse uh, had that whole orchard. Uh, they, there were apricots and plum trees that was, and uh, orange trees were uh, some of the uh, orchard products that uh, were popular in Niles. This house still exists at the base of a Riverside Avenue and Third Street, right down the street from where we live. My favorite part of this picture is the train here in mid steam. <laughs> uh, from, uh, yeah, the 1870 uh, uh, railroad depot, uh, that building's still here in Niles. It just got moved somewhere else. Uh, in, uh, let's go to the next one. Okay. Um, here is Niles in 1915. The uh, 1870 train depot has been replaced by a 1901 train depot. And uh, there's quite a few more buildings in Niles by that time. Uh, 1915 was uh, also when uh, the uh, SNA Film Company was active. I'll just to let you know, in case you're wondering, gee, it looks a little fuzzy. It does, so it's not it's not your eyes. Here is a, a street view of Niles. Uh, to the left is the Oddfellows Hall, uh, built in 1895, which got replaced by a brick Oddfellows Hall in 1929. The two buildings next to it are still there in their original spot. And then one next to it uh, uh, is the uh, first brick building in Niles, built in 1909. The bottom part is still there. The top part, which was uh, an auditorium, is gone now. It uh, 
the brick building was a little bit shaky with the second story. So they removed it around 1940. And uh, the uh, streetscape continues on. Some of those buildings are still there. Others have disappeared uh, with time. Jumping to 1948, uh, the streetscape looks quite a bit different. The uh, Niles Theater sign is from the second movie theater built in Niles in 1923. And uh, uh, that building is gone. It burnt down in 1959. It's covering, the, the sign is covering the original 1913 movie theater that is the home of our museum. In 1912, the SNA Film Company came to Niles. They first set up in a barn on Second Street, and the next year, uh, they were so happy with the progress that they were making that they built a uh, state-of-the-art film studio that cost $52,000. And there it is, uh, uh, facing what's today Niles Boulevard, in those days, it was called Front Street. Behind the studio, they built 10 houses for cast and crew people. All 10 of those houses still survive in Niles, uh, but uh, three of them have been moved because when they were built, they crowded the property line so they could get as many houses in as possible. And in the 1920s, when they were going to be sold as individual houses, the, uh, some of them had to be moved so they could put the others back onto the property lines. And this photograph also is a telltale sign of why movies weren't made in the sound era. As you can see, this train tracks, it was great to get people and lumber and things to the studio, but when it's a uh, hundred yards away from where the studio is, it's a little hard to uh, have perfectly quiet sound. Especially when there were 24 passenger trains a day coming through Niles <laughs> because it was a hub. Uh, Niles Canyon was the first way through the East Bay mountain range into the uh, uh, San Francisco Bay area. And so that's why the Transcontinental Railroad came through Niles Canyon and why uh, after the Nile station was established, if you wanted to go from Oakland to San Jose, you went through Niles. If you wanted to go through from Sacramento to Oakland or San Jose, you also went through Niles. Uh, something else that's, I, I think, really important to point out is silent films were never silent, ever. Uh, it was a very noisy process, um, but, uh, you know, between the people yelling and things happening and construction, everything. It was just not a silent process. It's just, you just didn't hear it because they didn't, um, you know, because obviously there was no sound. So I'm also wanting to make sure that people can see the, uh, our, our slides completely. Cause I know we have ourselves pictured here uh, on part of this. Um, okay. Uh, they, uh, here are the, uh the first six of the bungalows that were built in 1912, four more in 1913. This is up above it is how they look today. If you look at the bottom of the screen uh, where the uh, uh, guy is standing next to the telephone pole, that is Gilbert M. Bronco Billy Anderson, who was the A of SNA uh, and uh, established the uh, Western SNA studio in Niles. So here we are going to introduce everybody to you. So to the left is George Spohr, who was the business businessman at the SNA studio. He was the S of SNA, and uh, he remained in the uh, Chicago studio, the main studio in Chicago, which was established in 1907. Uh, Gilbert Anderson in the middle uh, was the A of SNA, and. Uh, he provided the uh, ability to make films. He was a director, writer, producer, and actor for the company. And uh, starting in 
1910, he made his first Bronco Billy Western in El Paso, Texas. And uh, by the time he came to Niles, he was known worldwide as Bronco Billy Anderson. And uh, the picture of him on the screen here is him standing on 2nd Street in Niles. You can just see a little bit of an edge of one of the SNA bungalows in the background uh, uh, framing the uh, Niles Hills. Uh, a couple of other people who worked at the studio, Francis X. Bushman worked out of the Chicago studio. And uh, he's in, in the three people here on the left. He's the, on the far left. In the middle there is Charlie Chaplin visiting the uh, Chicago studio. He only made one film there in Chicago, his due job. And then on the right is Bronco Billy Anderson out of his uh, costume. And we're putting in a plug for a film that we produced um, called This is Francis X. Bushman. It's one of the top sellers right now on Amazon for <laughs> silent film documentaries. <laughs> uh, of course, there's only so many in that. Uh, anyway, just uh, if you take a look and see our product. Uh, a, another popular star at the studio was Ben Turpin. He was actually their first actor starting in 1907 in a, a film called An Awful Skate, and he played a hobo on roller skates bumping into people on the street. And that was the whole story of the film. Yeah, but the great thing about Ben Turpin, it's much like the circus, especially in the early days. Not only was he their star, but he was also their night janitor. <laughs> uh, in the rest, the other picture uh, the, the, in Niles, they produced, uh, besides the Bronco Billy Westerns, Snakeville comedies. And this is a scene from uh, Snakeville's impersonator, I think it's called, mm -hmm. uh, with uh, uh, Victor Potel as Slippery Slim, uh, Ernest Van Pelt as the impersonator, Harry Todd as Mustang Pete, and Margaret Jocelyn Todd as Sophie Klutz. And yes, it's about a guy who dresses up as a woman and uh, much to <laughs> Sophie. See, Sophie was used to being the only woman in town. That was kind of the gag of the snake bill players. And so all the men were vying for her affections. Well, now she has someone who she's having to vie against. The trick <laughs> being played uh, on Harry Todd or, or Mustang Pete by Slippery Slim. Yes. <laughs> which is found out at the end as you'd imagine. Uh, Charlie Chaplin made five films while he was in Niles. The first one was A Night Out. Uh, he brought Ben Turpin from Chicago with him and, and Ben stayed in Niles for the uh, rest of his SNA career, which was another year. Uh, this, so this is a set on the glass enclosed stage that was uh, used at the studio and you can see in the corner there. Let me go back to this one picture so you can see it. So over here is the glass enclosed stage so you can see where it is based on the, uh, the studio. So now back to this. And there's the interior of the glass stage uh, during the making of The Champion, which is uh, another uh, uh, Chaplin's second SNA film. Uh, speaking of the champion, there's the poster for it and uh, the title card. Uh, all of uh, the champion was made in Niles. Uh, a night out, there were scenes shot in Oakland, San Jose, and Niles. And uh, um, Chaplin chose to stay in Niles for the champion. You can see on the left him walking by a fence, which uh, enclosed the back of the studio. Uh, that Vince is kind of reproduced in brick with the uh, fire station that's now on that side. Unfortunately, the studio was torn down in 1933. Uh, you can see that path that uh, Chaplin took uh, with the yellow arrows there uh, along the side of the building. And uh, that, there's a doorway that he goes through and uh, in one direction in the film, you can see the Township Register newspaper office and, uh, and the uh, Southern Pacific Freight Building uh, next to it in the background. 
Um, there's a other picture of the township register office. And you can see the doorway and the fence and, uh, and uh, as chaplains going through the doorway, the glass enclosed stage in the background. Uh, then and now what uh, the studio looked like in 1928 and uh, the same location today. It looks like it was made out of solid brick, but actually it was made with that. pressed steel. You can see it better on this shot, uh, the uh, pressed steel facing of the studio building. Picture a drafty garage. That would be more apropos. And in the background is the uh, um, grandstand for the uh, baseball park called Sullivan's Park, where uh, games were played every Sunday during the baseball season. Here's uh, another picture of the park during the making of Snakeville's Champion with Ben Turpin in 1915. Another shot again and here, and then the, below is the uh, baseball team itself uh, with the uh, uh, team lined up. When SNA came to town, the Niles team was one of the worst teams in the league and, and Gilbert Anderson, who uh, was a huge baseball fan, didn't like that. So he took over the team, sponsored it and uh, hired real baseball players for the team and also hired them to work at the SNA studio. And they became one of the best teams in the league as a result. So there was at least one player here, I think that's important to note. Uh, where's Raleigh? He's back here. So Raleigh Tothero. So Raleigh Tothero starts out as a third baseman for the San Rafael Colts. When uh, they go to play a game, there's Cowboys and Indians running all over the place uh, on the their field. No permits or anything. And it was the SNA crew making a film. This is when they arrived in San Rafael before Niles in 1911 and stayed there for seven months and made 42 films. So, so Tother, that's where he meets Anderson at that time. Uh, Anderson offers him a job to play on the team. And in his off time, he could work for the studio. So he actually was an actor for a short time, realized he didn't really like being in front of the camera. So he went behind the camera, learned his craft. And when the studio closed down, he ends up getting hired by Chaplin down in Los Angeles. And he becomes his cinematographer for the next 38 years one of the longest relationships ever, one of the, you know, two or three relationships of that time uh, um, period. Um, and uh, he, so if you see any movie by Chaplin from 1916 on, it'll say cinematography by R.H. Tothero. So uh, we call him our Raleigh. And there's a wonderful folk singing troubadour, Michael McNevin, who wrote a song called I Shot Bronco Billy about Raleigh Tothero shooting Bronco Billy and then Chaplin. Uh, look it up on YouTube. I shot Bronco Billy, Michael McNevin. It's totally worth the listen. It's a great little historical song. Uh, on the left here is Edna Provines, who was Chaplin's leading lady standing uh, uh, in the background. You can, on the right, you can see the uh, Southern Pacific Freight Building. And it looks like on the left, that might be the uh, studio building in the background. Um, this is what it looks like nowadays. They uh, turned around. A whole different angle though. Uh, the, yeah. uh, this is from the other, other side of the track, so to speak, <laughs> um, with the uh, um, Southern Pacific uh, uh, train depot and the uh, freight building that got moved to the back of the lot. It's now a, uh, a uh, open plaza area. Uh, over, over on this side. But yeah, so they actually took the not so attractive side that would have been facing the street and they turned it around. So the pretty side is available to be seen on the plaza. So this would have been at the back of the station. So not the where when people got off, they wouldn't have seen this side. And uh, here is a, a, a bigger view of the uh, making of the champion with Charlie in the middle there. 
during an interior scene in a, uh, uh, it's a boxing film. In the middle of the frame is uh, Roscoe Fatty Arbuckle, who is visiting the set uh, with uh, Edna, uh, Mabel Norman and uh, There's Edna. Edna Provence in her costume. Um, Charlie had met Roscoe and Mabel when he was working for the Keystone studio the year before. And, uh, and uh, Roscoe and Mabel had been in the Bay Area making some films for the, the Key Studio uh, in, in Golden Gate Park and the Panama Pacific Exposition and Idora Park in Oakland for uh, a week or two. And uh, so they came by Niles to visit. And you can see that the uh, glass enclosed stage let in the sunlight, but kept out in the, the wind and rain. And this is a view from the other direction to show what the studio looked like. You can see it here from the outside, uh, from a side view that was taken from the top of the uh, Edison Theater, which is a, again, our uh, museum. Uh, in the background is the school building and you can see the baseball park uh, uh, beyond the studio building and, and where the trees are is a California nursery company that had 600 acres of nursery land, uh, the with biggest uh, nursery west of the Mississippi. Square mile. It's being turned into a historical park uh, by the city of Fremont, slow but sure. And then the school, the fun the thing about schools, when they used the school children in their movies, they would pay them, they would let school out early and they would pay them with an ice cream cone. And we still do that when we have our Charlie Chaplin lookalike contest. The big prize, as far as I'm concerned, uh, is always to get ice cream at the ice cream parlor. So here is the side of our Edison Theater building in 1913, the same year that the SNA studio was built. And uh, in the back here is uh, the auditorium where we show movies when we can show movies. We haven't started up quite yet again, but we do have the front part open uh, where the museum and the museum store is. Uh, on the second floor is, uh, were built two apartments uh, for a little bit extra income. In those days, Niles only had 1,400 people, so the theater needed as much income as they could get. Uh, and the top here, during the making of the champion, you can see the top of our theater building in the background. And uh, that's how that side looks today. Chaplin's last film in Niles was The Tramp. He utilized Niles Canyon extensively in that film at the beginning and the end of the film. And uh, that Location is still identifiable today in the canyon. It's 1.8 miles in from Mission Boulevard. And um, there's little indications that uh, some of the Bronco Belly films were made in that same area. They used the Niles Canyon uh, uh, as a backdrop for many, many uh, films that were shot in Niles. Uh, over 350 films were made in Niles during the time that SNA was there from 1912 to 1916. And uh, I'd say a, a good two thirds or more used uh, shots in the canyon for one scene or another. This is one of the most famous images of all cinematic history. It, he walked away from several of his films at the end, but this is the first time he did that. And he was walking away from Niles at the end. And then he went on to Los Angeles where he worked still for SNA, but- um, but made, made more films for the company. And then got hired away. The That's a whole nother story unto itself is the whole story of Chaplin and all that, but uh, we'll save that for later or another day. <laughs> Here's another scene from the tramp uh, where he's watering trees in an orchard with a watering can. And what I've told people, I told David, he would figure out where this was done. And his response was, well, gee, 
you know, all of Niles was an orchard at one point and oh. these trees are long gone. And I said, you know, somehow you're gonna figure this out. So what happened was John Bankson, who's a locations expert, he's been using Blu-rays. People may not realize the Blu-rays show you things that even watching the movie on a big screen might not show you just because of the detail. And the fleeting glimpse in a um, moving motion picture doesn't often give you the uh, the chance to to look. And so when you get a Blu-ray frame grab, then uh, suddenly all this information is revealed. So here we saw five pillars and a slope shaped roof. What could that be? And I thought, sure, we'd never know, but we have access to something that most people don't have access to. There was a gentleman named E.E. E. Diaz, who was a general contractor from the mid 1950s to 19, I'm sorry, the mid 1920s to the mid 19 to 1959. Fremont became a city in Fremont in uh, 1956. So Niles became part of that. But on, before that time, as you can imagine, photography was only uh, so used. And so he took pictures of a lot of the buildings that he moved. He moved about 25 buildings around town, which wasn't impossible when they didn't have plumbing or electrical, except for what they added on. Also, he did a lot of the, um, the, the, uh, the curbs and sidewalks that you can still see. Once in a while, you can still see a stamped E.E. Diaz on there. His granddaughter gave David all of his blueprints, photographs, of the buildings before he destroyed them and made new ones. And even the camera that took all the photographs. So these five pillars duplicate what was in the uh, other shot. And you can see the uh, roof of this building to the left. Uh, what you see in the film is the other side of that building with uh, the similar looking pillars. <laughs> and uh, so that identifies the location as uh, the 1912 schoolhouse that was replaced in 1939 with a uh, newer schoolhouse that's still there today. So Mr. Diaz took this picture in 1939 when he replaced it with the now 80 year old uh, auditorium. So that is why he was able to figure that out because he had photographic evidence. And also, let's go on next. Come on now, go to the next slide. Uh oh, I'm hoping we have still have power. Okay, um, so we had. Okay, here we are. So, why don't you tell them about Sanborn? Uh, so, uh, the Sanborn Fire Insurance Company uh, created maps for every big city and little town in the United States for fire insurance purposes and they would duplicate the footprints of every building in town and uh, do that as each town grew. So uh, in 1892, when Niles only had about 200 people, uh, they did their first map and then they did one in 1898, in 1907, 1920, 1929, 1944. This map from 1920 shows the uh, Niles Schoolhouse, the 1912 Schoolhouse, and uh, what would be opposite would be an orchard, uh, which they don't show in this particular uh, view. But uh, um, the 1929 map, I believe, does show does show the orchard, the orchard, and uh, gives you a view of of uh, uh, what that location was. It's pretty amazing to me though that, I mean, here a lot of kids nowadays want to, you know, think about all the new techniques and they had a Google Maps essentially from a hundred years ago. That's just mind blowing to me that, that uh, they actually were keeping track of things that closely. So uh, here is a composite view of our theater building taken uh, more or less today and in 1915 with Chaplin out of costume uh, next to his leading lady, Edna Proviance, uh, taken uh, with a view of the uh, house that's still next door, next to the uh, theater building with the uh, studio in the background and the original facade to the theater uh, showing next door. Which we hope to replace or uh, replicate. Remodel. Remodel, that's it. 
So something that's really important to know about our museum is we actually, our group owns it, a nonprofit organization owning a building. What happened? Well, our, the original landlord, Al Lopez Sr. and his wife, Vicky, always wanted the place to turn back into a theater, which seemed like a real pipe dream. His son uh, and mother, um, Vicky, uh, they ended up putting it in, in her trust. So when she passed, this building became part of our group's thing. I mean, I, to get real estate in 2020, now the timing of it was amazing. We got the keys literally uh, within a matter of a couple of weeks before COVID hit. So we are now at the beginning of a capital campaign to do some major restoration. Uh, we have a brick foundation. We need, we have hundred year old plumbing and electrical. So we are gonna be looking to raise at least $2 million to fix this place up to look the way it was back in the day, but better. <laughs> And this is the original SMA Indian Head logo that was designed in 1909 uh, for their studio logo. All of the film companies of that era and even today have their own logos. And uh, uh, SMA chose an Indian Head for whatever reason. Chicago was uh, once an Indian, Indian settlement, and uh, George Spore's sister, Mary Spore, uh, who was an Art Institute graduate designed that, that uh, logo. I mean, you know that Mutual of Omaha and lots of other companies had Native Americans in their logo. So we're gonna stop share right now and get back to. Okay. Thanks, David. Thanks, Rena. Um, I think we've got you frozen somehow. Uh, so hopefully you can hear me. Uh, and we do have some questions, um, if we can unfreeze you. Um, I hope everybody that stayed with me, uh, stayed with us, excuse me, uh, enjoyed the slides. I thought that the slides were absolutely a blast in the way that they um, contrasted the then and now and actually complemented the then and now. Uh, there's a lot of Niles that um, still looks the same way as it did uh, in 1910. Uh, and as I said earlier, if you haven't made it to Niles, it's well worth the trip. Uh, I would heartily recommend the Silent Film Museum, and you can help them out with their um, rebuild project. Uh, David, Marina, are you guys out there? Okay. Um, so we'll... Again, hang with us for a little bit. We'll get them back. And uh, we do have some questions to, to answer. Um, <laughs> and there are people that have been in the Niles that are chiming in. So from Jan, uh, she recommends Bronco Billy's Pizza. Uh, so lots of fun stuff in it and also pretty good pizza. All right. Uh, I don't see those guys, so let's um, let's talk about next time around. Um, we will be back with our next program on February the 17th uh, at 11.30, again, a Thursday. Um, you may remember we had Garrett Daly, a John Muir scholar, uh, some months ago, and he talked about John Muir uh, the inventor, John Muir's uh, family life, um, sort of how he became uh, the person he became. So on February 17th, Garrett Daly is going to rejoin us and um, talk about another aspect of Muir's life. Um, we don't know that much, at least I didn't, uh, about Muir being a, a world traveler, uh, an explorer, and so Garrett Daly uh, is going to be talking to us about Muir, um, who, like Mark Twain, went on to become a world celebrity. Uh, and he'll be talking about his um, travels and his exploits. And I see David and Rena back. Yeah, we uh, So let's get yeah. to some questions real quick. Um, we had two questions that I think were related. I, I had heard Niles being called the first Hollywood. Is that accurate? And 
Why did SNA uh, Studios choose Niles uh, as uh, a home for itself? Uh, so uh, there were many other locations before Niles that uh, films were made. Uh, if you want to, um, it really started back east in New York and uh, Fort Lee, New Jersey, uh, before anybody came to uh, California. And in fact, uh, Gilbert Anderson of SNA was uh, one of the first companies to uh, arrive from back east to uh, California. In the Bay Area, the Miles Brothers in San Francisco had already established a studio that was destroyed in the 1906 earthquake. But Anderson came here in Niles, I mean, came to San Francisco in December of 1908, got rained out. He'd never been to California before. And uh, people told him, well, you need to go to Southern California. He went down there and uh, shot some films down there before coming back to the Chicago studio. Didn't really like Southern California. And he kept coming back to the Bay Area. He was in Los Gatos in 1910. Got rained out again, went down to Southern California, shot some films there, came back up to San Rafael in 1911, made, a, as I said before, uh, 42 films in seven months, uh, went back down to Southern California to uh, Lakeside near San Diego. <laughs> then his cameraman discovered Niles, and uh, they came in April of 1912. And the really the besides the weather in Niles, which is a little bit different than a lot of the rest of the Bay Area, the more sunny days. The thing that real uh, perfect for Western filming, and uh, and they never looked back after that. Uh, they uh, they made over three hundred and fifty films in four years. Tell them about getting arrested with the duck. That's a great Southern California story. Um, when they were down in uh, Southern California in December of 1908, uh, they were filming in Westlake Park. And uh, their one uh, uh, comedian with the group was Ben Turpin. And uh, they, uh, they made this film there. And uh, Anderson thought it would be a funny thing to have Ben chase after a duck in the park lake. And uh, when uh, Ben jumped in the lake, uh, a uh, policeman spotted them and uh, didn't like what they were doing. So he arrested them all for uh, be, uh, as a public nuisance and told them never to film in Los Angeles again. That might have been, been one of the reasons why Anderson didn't like Los Angeles. <laughs> well, so if people say, wasn't Niles the original Hollywood, I'll say, well, no, the actual original Hollywood is West Orange or Fort Lee, New Jersey. And honestly, Californians don't like to hear that. They want everything to be that we were first, but East Coast has got to be given the props. It slowly worked its way across the United States. And there was lots of reasons why the industry uh, came, not just because of the sunny weather to California, but we have to say that Hollywood, California was happening at the same time Niles was happening. And, uh, but we can say that Niles was the most prolific Northern California company, and that's including Pixar and Coppola and Lucas and all of that combined, wow. combined, you, you know, the product, there was more product out of Niles. And, wow. But in, in 1915, there were a number of studios all over the Bay Area filming. There was the California Motion Picture Corporation in San Rafael. Uh, in San Mateo, there was first the Liberty Film Company and later Pacific Studios uh, on Peninsula Avenue. Uh, there was a short-lived company in San Jose, uh, in Oakland, Berkeley, other places. So, so really um, probably Miles Brothers and SNA were probably, you know, the earlier film um, kings, if you want to call it that way. Uh, why they left Niles. So now you know why they came to Niles. Why they left Niles was because um, the company closed, um, but SNA didn't. So what happened is Spore is the money guy. He's making money and he's working on the money. He actually should be given really a lot of credit because he was kind of one of the uh, forebearers of Netflix. He, before you'd had to buy a reel of film to, uh, as a theater owner. 
And he realized that if you rented out films and returned them for re-showing again and again, you can make a lot more money. The prices would go lower. You could show a lot more film, a lot more products. So that was a good thing. So he was you know, a very smart guy and in control of the money. He also um, developed a service called the Kinodrome service that provided films, uh, projectors, and operators to uh, theaters around the country. And he set up these, uh, this business in 120 Orpheum theaters around the country. And that's what made his first fortune. But the problem, he was also wanting to keep things, keep control of things. That was actually why Chaplin only made one movie in Chicago. So Chaplin gets hired by SNA and said, and sees Niles and is kind of underwhelmed. It's kind of in the sticks in a sense, it's near San Francisco, but it's still not San Francisco. So he says, can I make my movies in Chicago? And Anderson being Mr. Casual said, sure. So they go there. He makes a grand total of one film before he realizes that they flip the lights off at five o'clock. They send everybody home. It's just not going to, you know, he, he didn't get to work until he was done. And so he realized things would be more casual in Niles. So that's why he went back to Niles, made those five films. In fact, Spore even sent a, um, a punch clock, time clock to Niles so they could start punching in. And it evidently came back to Chicago in pieces and with bullet holes in it. <laughs> The Cowboys didn't like to punch a time clock. No, I think that. Uh, and Anderson gave Chaplin free reign and Niles to do whatever he wanted. And uh, that made all the difference. Before it came back, mailed back, I think that they that one, the first person who ever got to the studio would punch everybody in. And then the last person would punch everybody out and all that. Um, so now we know why. So, so what happens is 1916, Chaplin's been working them for, for a year. His contract's coming up. He's not going to get renewed because Spore doesn't want to spend the money because he's become this huge Chaplinitis big time star. So Chaplin's not getting signed on. Anderson's very upset about that. And also the fact that they're only making one and two real films. He wants to start making what are now being called features, multiple reels of film. And Spore said, nah, we're good. Stay, keep with the, the one and two. The Bronco Billies are making too much money. He yeah. doesn't want to stop that. So what happens is, is he, uh, so... Bronco Billy, uh, Anderson just cashes out. Just cash me out, I'm done. And so that was like February, January, February of 1916. So with, you know, they were in the middle of filming a film, everything stopped, everything closed down. So they just built a whole new wing to the Chicago studio. They didn't really need the Nile studio anymore. So they just closed the doors. And so that's what happened. The doors closed and they tried to bring movies back to Niles over the next couple of decades. And then uh, over the next decade, but really talkies started happening in 1927, 28, and you could see how close they were to the train tracks. So that wasn't going to happen. So that was really the death knell of the SNA studios. Two years later, uh, Spore closes the Chicago studios, but his own choice that, you know, because he was making, he invested a lot of money into a 3D process, which didn't go anywhere called natural vision. There is a natural vision out there, but that's not the same one. His version was perfected in 1930 at the worst possible time. Oh, yeah. Talking coming in. And, and uh, he yeah. got shut out and, and allegedly lost $4 million so, in 1930. So that was what, that's why everything kind of happened. So, but, and also Anderson was given the response, um, the uh, penalty, I guess, of not playing Bronco Billy for two years. So from 1916 to 1918, he wasn't allowed to play Bronco Billy. Well, Tom Mix and William S. Tart came, totally superseded him. He was old news. I mean, it was already a stretch, but he was the very first cowboy movie star. And that is okay. also something that's very important. So I want to jump in for a second, because this was a question. Um, we've heard about Bronco Billy the pizza. How about Bronco Billy the man? Who was Bronco Billy? And uh, you talk about his successors, but um, tell us about Bronco Bill. Um, was, uh, one of those um, uh, early creative pioneers. He, he got an Oscar in 1958 for his contributions to motion pictures as entertainment. Uh, he, was, he started out at the Edison Film Company in a film called The Great Train Robbery, uh, performing in it in three different roles. They would do that often in the early days. 
from there, he went to become a director at the Vitagraph Film Studio, uh, made a film called Raffles, the Amateur Cracksman, uh, which was a big hit in those days. Um, uh, went to the Sealy Polyscope Company in 1906 and uh, and, and uh, advanced that studio. Uh, so he was a, a big name in the early years as a director, writer, producer. And uh, uh, when he created his Bronco Billy character, it became he became a worldwide star. SNA had uh, outlets all over the world, uh, not just in the United States, but in London, France, uh, Berlin, Australia. So his films were seen around the world. And uh, uh, so he was one of the uh, biggest names in the world in during his heyday as a, an actor. We actually say that he's much more important to the SNA company than Charlie Chaplin. Oh. Uh, um, only because of his role, but we cannot, we know that Chaplin is our gateway entertainer, get him in the door for Chaplin, then they get to hear the gospel of Bronco Billy. Um, if you want to see some fun uh, online things, please go to our website, nilesfilmmuseum.org. And when you go down, there's a bunch of icons. One of the icons says online happenings. So when you click on there, you can see all the programs we've been doing since June of 2020. We started out with our Charlie Chaplin days, which we normally have in person, of course. We've had two of those online so far. I pray we get to see it in person this year. Um, but in addition, every month we've had different programs. And I think it was either August or September of 2020, we did uh, some um, talking about different studios, Vitagraph, Biograph, that sort of thing. We also talked about the Edison Lab and we got to go visit there uh, a couple of years ago. Boy, was that amazing. Um, one thing we did do, because David is also a locations geek uh, or nerd, maybe we should say nerd, nerd's a much better word. Um, and he was able to find one of the locations for the Great Train Robbery. It was known to be filmed in Patterson, New Jersey, but the exact location was not known, uh, or at least it was guessed upon, guessed upon. He actually took five different still frames and stitched them together, figured out the trajectory of the sun. Yeah, that sort of thing. So um, take a look at that program about the um, Bronco Billy, his role in the Great Train Robbery, and then also the uh, finding the location for the Great Train Robbery. So I see another location here, um, or another question here about why did SNA have anything to do with the name Niles on the hillside? Well, it's actually an aerial marker. It, was, uh, it came after the studio was here. It was covered up during World War II, as you'd imagine. If you go to San, South San Francisco, you'll see SSF, an industrial city. Same thing, it's an aerial marker. But it is fun because it does make it a little Hollywood-esque. Yeah. First but, one was uh, built in the 1920s and then they built it out of concrete in the 1930s. And, uh, um, and it was kind of crumbling to pieces and they redid it again in 1990. And actually, even the original Hollywood sign was not Hollywood, the filmmaking mecca. It was Hollywood land. They were selling properties there. And then the word land fell down and then the rest is history that the Hollywood sign was indicating the movie place. Really? Yeah. So can you uh, give the uh, museum's website again, and also sure. how about the hours of operation? Uh, I will open to the public hours. Well, actually, that you can get you can get that um, on our website, but we will say it as well. So it's nilesfilmmuseum.org, and uh, right now we are open twelve to four Saturdays and Sundays. That's for the museum and for our store. And uh, if we get more volunteers, we can open longer hours. Uh, we are hoping to start movies up again soon. Uh, we're not even really wanting to say the individual month, but we're looking towards closer to summer. Um, just COVID stuff is really uh, so questionable. We really want to make sure because most of our clients and many of our volunteers are seniors. So um, as it is, uh, the store and the museum right now is where we're at. And we're doing online programming. So please take a look at all of our online stuff. We've got some really interesting things. April is our earthquake show. We had focuses um, uh, and we, and I'm, yeah, in February of 2020, 
2021, we had a focus on Reginald Denny and had everything from boxing to, um, to, to uh, race cars to aviation. I mean, just, there's just all kinds of, all kinds of topics. Okay. So that's it for questions for us. And um, I'd like to, first of all, thank you too. Uh, I neglected to say in the beginning what, uh, what each of you does. And so David, as you could probably tell is the historian, and Rena's job description is so long that we would be here for another half an hour. So um, they were terrific. As you can tell, they know their stuff. I can heartily recommend, and I don't work for the Niles Chamber of Commerce, but I can heartily recommend the trip to Niles. The um, Silent Film Museum does great stuff, uh, fun stuff. And um, uh, check out the projection room while you're there. It's the only thing I can say. Um, so thank you, too. Uh, and I'd like to thank everybody for viewing this morning. If you missed any of our earlier programs, you can find them by visiting our museum's website at museumsrv.org. Uh, today's program will appear early next week. As I mentioned during our downtime, our next program will be February the 17th at 1130. Uh, and it'll be Garrett Daly, John Muir Scholar, who was here with us before a few months ago to talk about Muir's family background and his inventions and a lot of other things that we don't remember him for. Um, we remember his work to save Yosemite and the Redwoods, but did you know that Muir was also a world traveler? Um, he um, was an explorer, a traveler, and John, or excuse me, Garrett Daly will talk about John Muir the explorer, his travels and his exploits. So if you like these programs and want them to continue, we ask that you make a donation by going to the museum's homepage, museumsrv.org, and clicking on the Donate Now button. Uh, we are all, like the Silent Film Museum, we all function off of volunteers. So if um, you can give us some time, uh, please contact the museum. I hope you enjoyed today's, uh, today's presentation. We apologize for the technical problems, but I, we did get them ironed out. Uh, so on behalf of the museum, I would like to wish you um, safe travels, uh, stay safe, and thank you for watching this morning. <laughs>